Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you guys so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. Today is the first in a special series, TBI Tuesdays, Traumatic Brain Injury Tuesdays. I'll be sharing a couple chapters from TBI or CTE, What the Hell Was Wrong With Me. I'll share a couple of chapters every week and talk about those uh, chapters, pointing out what I learned, anything interesting about it, and also uh, sites you can go for help. I decided to do this just to help spread the awareness. I think it's really important. I usually have a problem where I focus on my fiction. I don't want to talk about nonfiction, especially when I'm done with it. But this is a very serious subject. I think a lot of people are impacted by traumatic brain injuries. They have no idea that it might be impacting their brain health, their mental health. And so I hope you guys get something good from this. All right, let's get into it. TBI or CTE, what the hell is wrong with me? First, the dedication to Michael, Poorman, and Sarah. This book would not have been written if it were not for you opening your home and hearts to me. I will always appreciate this. Can't express that enough after you guys hear this book and why you'll you'll understand why I felt that way. Also, real quick, wanna do the author's note. I am not a scientist, doctor, health expert, or role model. I'm just a guy trying to find his best way through life. My goal is not to make you an expert on traumatic brain injuries or brain health. I'd much rather help you take an honest look at yourself and fill you with hope that you can improve your mental well-being. Instead of a book filled with footnotes, you'll find at the back of this book a list of all the books and websites I trusted for information. I encourage you to turn to those books for deeper explanations and to do your own research through your own sources. We're all unique individuals and what works for me doesn't mean it'll do the same for you. I wish you the best and hope this book helps you achieve improved quality of life. TBI or CTE. What the hell is wrong with me? Written by Mark Tullius. Read for you by Derek Dysart. Prologue. I should never own a gun again. That's what I just wrote down before I rationalized it away. Not trusting myself with a gun is a scary thought. Not the kind I should be having on a Saturday night after sitting front row for the subversive Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournament that my 10th Planet teammates dominated. I'd been tempted to use cannabis before the show, but I stayed sober intentionally, aware I was in a bad funk that needed to be examined instead of buried in smoke. My anxiety is generally high around crowds, and loud music only amplifies it. My wife, Jen, was understanding and helped me deal at the venue. And while I did enjoy the matches, the downtime between them was where I realized there was a problem. Everyone else was talking and having a good time, and I was sitting there on the verge of tears, unable to explain what the hell I was experiencing. Now, safe at home, waiting for my vaporizer to warm up, I understand part of the problem is depression. I have not been able to train much the past two years due to neck, back, and shoulder issues. Jiu-Jitsu has been a big part of my life, and it sucks not being able to roll. Yet, it goes even deeper than that. News reports replay over and over in my mind. Junior Seau and Andre Waters killing themselves. Aaron Hernandez and his ravaged brain convicted of the murder of a friend. I worry about Gary Goodridge and my numerous MMA and boxing friends dealing with varying degrees of brain damage. I consider my Brown University teammates who are in brain studies, one of whom I just spent three days with talking about what chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, has done to his life, and that he now only has a short time to live thanks to the combination of the neurodegenerative disease and acute myeloid leukemia. This man, who'd been told he had the frontal lobe of a 75-year-old, rattled off stories about myself that I can't recollect, my time at Brown, and much of my life, a messy blur. I tell myself to get over it. I'm making this into something bigger than it needs to be. I haven't had nearly the amount of head trauma NFL players have had. Except for excessive caffeine and cannabis use, I've led a healthy lifestyle over the last decade. 
If my brain is deteriorating, surely I'd be aware of it. But I can't deny that feeling's back. The one I've kept at bay through yoga, jujitsu, cognitive therapy, meditation, cold therapy, alcohol, and psychedelics. That dark, scary feeling I've had since I was 10, if not younger. The mixture of rage and depression doesn't compute. It used to for the explosive child, the troubled teenager, the failed fighter, the loser who never did a damn thing with his degree. But now, I have a beautiful life with a wonderful wife and two incredible children. We're set financially and everyone's healthy. I have close friends and a good support system. I'm publishing books at a nice pace, and I have found a balance between family and writing. My vaporizers warmed up, so I turned it on, filled the bag with THC, breathe it in. Load up another one because, holy shit, I want this feeling to go away. But I stick with it, not willing to be a coward. Perhaps I lucked out and am blessed with a resilient brain. All those concussions and knockouts not having any lasting effect. Anyone that's read my fiction knows I'm a doom and gloom kind of guy, so maybe I'm just hardwired to focus on the negative. And even if all those brain injuries did cause problems, surely I'd gotten past them by now, especially with the treatment protocol I'm on. But still, I must consider the symptoms. Impulsive behavior? Guilty. Whether gambling, video games, or drugs, I can be an addict. Memory loss. This one's not even funny. I can't tell you the number of times friends have shown me photos of events to prove that I was there. I blame it on the weed. Difficulty planning and carrying out tasks. It takes me days to respond to emails. The littlest things are written down in hopes I'll one day do them. Substance abuse. 31 years of cannabis and counting, along with plenty of experimentation. Emotional instability. It's not all the time. Usually I'm a fairly happy, even sweet guy. But it doesn't take a whole lot to rock the ship. One crappy night of sleep and my emotions are all over the place. I don't respond well to confrontation. Depression or apathy. I never would have considered myself depressed until a year ago. But that's just due to the stigma behind the word. There's no denying that's what I'm experiencing. Suicidal thoughts or behavior. I struggle with this most of my life, spending too many of my college nights with a gun in my mouth. It's not something I would ever do now that I have kids, and the urge has been dormant for the past decade. But even a trace of that self-destructiveness is something I must be aware of. So regardless of the source of damage, there's something wrong with me. Whether it's from a traumatic brain injury, or TBI, CTE, substance abuse, childhood scars, or good old genetics, my brain is not in a great place. But it's all good. I'm going to fix it. I have to. Chapter 1 I never wanted to write this book. In fact, during the writing of the book Unlocking the Cage, my exploration of mixed martial artists, I swore I'd never write nonfiction again. That process of traveling to 100 gyms and interviewing 400 fighters and coaches was one of the best things I've ever done, but it was also time-consuming, expensive, and physically taxing. And it took me away from my fiction, where I control whether the ending is happy or sad. Prior to writing UTC, brain damage was the furthest thing from my mind. Back when I was fighting and playing football, I worried about week-long headaches and speech problems, but I seemed to bounce back from all of them. The last blow to my head had been in 2004, and I felt fine. My high scores on the brain training app Lumosity proof enough that somehow I'd made it through unscathed. So in 2012, I threw my out-of-shape 40-year-old ass into MMA workouts and got in better and better shape until eventually I was sparring. 
despite concussions from my head slamming off the mat at Team Quest in Oregon, nearly being knocked out at Syndicate MMA in Las Vegas, a nasty head kick at Alliance MMA in Chula Vista, and brutal beatings by Fabricio Verdun and Hanato Babalu at King's MMA in Huntington Beach. I plan to take a fight at 41 with absolutely nothing to gain by it. It was October 2013, two days after talking to a matchmaker about finding me an opponent. And I'd just survived the advanced class at 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu headquarters in Los Angeles, where I'd been training a few weeks. I was exhausted and everything hurt, but the MMA coach talked me into sparring with his young fighters. It was ugly, but I hung in there for four rounds without having a heart attack. On the way to the car, my childhood friend and photographer, Brian Esquivel, asked if I'd read any articles about brain damage in football players and MMA fighters. As delicately as he could, he pointed out that I'd been getting the shit kicked out of me by athletes half my age. That night, I went to bed with a bad headache before I could do any research. But the next day, I started digging. I discovered that simply knowing that getting hit in the head isn't healthy and understanding why it's not are two very different things. The more I read about TBIs, the more I feared I had really screwed up. I was a reckless kid, experiencing my first serious concussion when I smacked my head on a schoolyard sprinkler when I was six or seven. It's impossible to count how many I've had since, but there have been plenty. In seven years of high school and college football, I lost consciousness six times. On top of that, I had constant trauma playing defensive line like a ram, always striking helmet to helmet. While attempting an MMA career, I was knocked out twice. On another two occasions, my brain was rattled so badly that I completely lost at least 15 minutes of time, and there were a ridiculous number of instances when I left the gym with a moderate concussion. During the two years I boxed, I constantly slurred my words and reversed their order. Add a few motorcycle accidents and a 70-mile-an-hour car collision, and it's amazing I can write my own name let alone novels. The cumulative brain trauma makes me a prime candidate for dementia and was likely responsible for my spotty memory. How ironic that now I'd found my passion for writing, wanting to do it until the day I die. It looked like there was a good chance I'd spend some of those years unable to care for myself. Determined not to make my odds of dementia any worse, I promised Jen that I wouldn't take any more strikes to the head and would settle for the somewhat gentle art of jujitsu. I'm proud that I only broke that promise one time, a final light sparring at Lausanne MMA in Massachusetts to drive home the lesson that I could no longer rationalize the risk. Although I wasn't excessively worried about my brain health, I was concerned enough to implement some recommendations I found online. I began playing brain games on Lumosity and a couple other platforms. My scores in the top percentiles assuring me I was fine. The other big takeaway from my limited research was the importance of exercise. Not only can regular exercise relieve stress, help with pain, and improve overall well-being, it's also good for the vascular system in your brain. Fortunately, I was motivated to continue training in jiu-jitsu and practicing yoga, feeling fit at the lightest weight I'd been since high school at 208 pounds. In July 2015, I wrote to the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas. Several of the fighters I'd interviewed for UTC were participants in their professional fighter brain health study and highly recommended I try it since the study needed retired as well as current fighters. The clinic sent me a stack of forms that I put off answering until an hour before my 10 o'clock appointment. It took me a while to tally up the number of matches, rounds, and concussions. Between boxing and MMA, I had 14 professional matches and a losing record, a sure sign I'd taken more damage than I had dealt. 
I drove to the clinic, past the old boxing gym where I'd been battered around by heavyweights I'd watch fight on TV. I popped a cannabis-infused gummy, the only way I could function under stress. Plus, if the study wanted to assess how I functioned on a daily basis, this would give them the best look. I had another gummy in my pocket for the halfway point of the four-hour test. Waiting for the cannabis to kick in, I walked around the building, even though I was sweating from the heat. The building's design was uniquely beautiful, a metallic masterpiece designed by Frank Gehry, but its chaotic curves filled me with a sense of dread, an image of a twisted brain. The courtyard and surroundings were relaxing and peaceful, though, and I was greeted by a friendly volunteer who guided me to reception. The lobby was full. No doubt, I was the youngest person by at least 10 years. I wondered what types of brain degeneration the different individuals might be suffering. I told myself, I don't fit in here. At least not yet. An assistant escorted me back and briefed me on the cognitive testing. I felt prepared because of lumosity and scored above average on some tests, but my reaction time was only average. Next up, I stumbled through a couple of speech tests, but the assistant assured me I was doing fine. The physical test was all about balance, and I was confident from doing a few months of yoga as rehab for a partially torn ACL. I felt solid standing with my feet together, hands on hips, eyes closed. But I just couldn't do it with my right leg raised. I tried again and again, but couldn't hold the pose for more than a second. The assistant didn't say whether that indicated anything significant. After a painless blood draw, I met with Dr. Charles Burnick, the associate medical director of the clinic and principal researcher of the study. At that time, the study included about 400 current and 50 retired fighters. I mentioned that I'd interviewed about the same number of MMA athletes from around the country and done a layman's assessment for noticeable signs of damage, especially with guys that had had long careers or taken a lot of abuse due to their fighting style. Overall, I'd detected very few indications of brain damage, even those with 40-plus fights under their belt, but I admitted that my brief and uneducated analysis was very limited since I didn't know the fighters before their careers, and their self-assessments probably weren't very accurate. I believed many fighters might not notice subtle changes in behavior or ability, and if they did, they often attributed it simply to aging. Dr. Burnick nodded and shared his similar impression of MMA fighters. He told me the repeated head trauma could lead to progressive neurological deficits, but it doesn't occur among all athletes. It's too early to guess what percentage of fighters might be affected, especially since the sport is so new and symptoms of permanent brain damage might not present for five years or more after the last trauma. I couldn't help but wonder what my odds were. What did my tests indicate? What did my awful balance reveal? We went over my history, Dr. Burnick taking note of everything, asking questions but skillfully avoiding my concerns. He continued the neurological examination by checking my reflexes, gait, and balance, and had me follow his fingers with my eyes. He discussed the goals of the project and said he hoped to answer many of the questions I had. The study's emphasis was on early identification of neurocognitive decline and prediction of long-term neurological consequences. They hope to discover why, with similar levels of trauma, some fighters are more at risk for a decline in brain health. With the MRI I was about to undergo and other tests I just finished, the researchers hope to detect even the earliest and most subtle signs of brain injury. By repeating these tests several years in a row, they hope to find biomarkers or clinical indicators that could predict cognitive decline and better understand the impact of each risk factor. With so many fighters involved in the study and the massive amount of data acquired, it seemed likely that the research team will reach their goals. The only problem is that, as to be expected with any volunteer longitudinal study, a number of participants won't complete the testing. 
The continued recording of data is where most answers will come from. Even if a fighter retires and no longer experiences head trauma, the comprehensive test results are invaluable. I left the clinic relieved at my results and committed to the study. I encouraged other fighters to participate in the research and be more aware of their own brain health, to be proactive, doing whatever they can to postpone any decline. I went back to the hotel, ate some more cannabis gummies, and went gambling, putting my worries to rest. Chapter 2 When I returned from the Cleveland Clinic, I fell back into my normal routines, taking care of my two-year-old son and seven-year-old daughter while working on the writing of the book, Unlocking the Cage, and the release of the book, Twisted Reunion, a collection of my short horror stories. Following the example of the fighters I'd interviewed, I adopted a much healthier lifestyle and continued to practice yoga and training jiu-jitsu, getting my purple belt from Eddie Bravo at the end of 2016. This is one of the few accomplishments I'm proud of, as it wasn't easy taking myself from being the joke of the gym, getting submitted by hundreds of different individuals each year, to holding my own against much younger athletes. In addition to eating better and exercising to help with any potential brain issues, I got my first guitar, continued playing brain games on Lumosity, and began learning German. I also started a podcast called Unlocking with my yogi and good friend Anthony Johnson. Our cannabis-fueled talks on and off air proved to be a very cathartic form of therapy. Events that stood out for me that year were getting a tattoo on my right calf, reading the book The Anatomy of Violence by Adrian Rain, and having a powerful experience with NN dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, the spirit molecule. 2017 was a much more stressful year, with neck, back, and shoulder injuries keeping me from both yoga and jiu-jitsu. I used the time off to use sensory deprivation tanks and tattoo my entire back with the illustration I intend to use for the cover of a fantasy trilogy I plotted out with my daughter. A chronic multitasker, I went into every tattoo session baked out of my mind so I could work on writing the book Ain't No Messiah, nearly passing out twice thanks to an unknown sensitivity to Vicodin. In October, I released the book Unlocking the Cage, which had great reviews but terrible sales. Another contributor to the ongoing depression I kept bottled up. I tried not to worry about having something wrong with my brain, but the ultimate yogi video I practiced to three nights a week had a message that always hit me hard. It mentions the average life expectancy of an NFL player is around 56, about 20 years younger than that of the average male in the U.S. I wondered how much of that difference could be attributed to problems arising from brain health. I began sharing articles and concerns over traumatic brain injuries, and in November I received several messages from former football teammates and MMA fighters. Many of these men were silently dealing with brain damage, some participating in brain studies, a couple at the end of their rope. It wasn't just about me anymore, something I could bury and forget about. Despite my promise that I wouldn't write any more nonfiction, I committed to explore chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, and write a book on it. My goal would be to determine if I have CTE and then try absolutely everything I could to reverse it. I'd take the same approach as I did with unlocking the cage, traveling around the country for interviews, testing, and help. My focus would be on fighters and football players, investigating what we're up against and sharing ways to deal with our situation. I amped up the recommended activities I'd been engaging in and added in cold water therapy, spending 15 to 30 minutes in my pool that averaged about 54 degrees. Even though I was in the middle of writing a sequel to my novel, Brightside, and novella, Try Not to Die in Brightside, I promised myself the brain book would have top priority in 2018. It was 10 a.m. on a Tuesday, a few weeks into the new year, and I was stoned in the backyard, 
discouraged by how little I'd worked on this book. I'd updated my list of experts I wanted to interview and therapies I'd like to attempt, but I had absolutely zero motivation to begin writing. Perhaps my desire to help others wasn't as strong as I believed. This wouldn't be the first time I lost interest in something soon after the initial excitement. Coming up with ideas is often more fun than seeing them through, especially when it involves dwelling on brain damage every day. One of the things I've been hearing over and over in yoga was about having compassion for myself. True, I hadn't written much, but I had been keeping up with recommended activities, including the Wim Hof-inspired breathing and cold water therapy that I was going to do the entire month. I'd committed to maintaining a well-balanced diet to help me feel better and regulate energy levels and was in the middle of a four-week cleanse, a way for me to drop weight and get rid of the nagging worry that begun since one of my best friends had been diagnosed with cancer. In addition to the activities, I also had been reading nonfiction. The book, The Brain That Changes Itself by Dr. Norman Doidge, is a fascinating book and largely responsible for my shifting out of hopelessness. Dr. Doidge looks at the new science of neuroplasticity and the people whose lives were transformed by it. The old thinking was that the brain could not be changed, only damaged. But this book shows just how powerful and adaptable our brains really are. In the book, Dr. Doidge tells the story of stroke patients learning to move and speak again, how cognitive therapy can rewire brains, how plasticity can stop worries and obsessions, and how incredibly powerful our imagination and beliefs can be. By the end of the book, I understood our brains are much more resilient and adaptable than I'd thought. Even if I had done damage to my brain, there was hope I could fix it. The next book I picked up had been buried in my to-read pile, which sits beside my probably-never-going-to-touch pile. I'd bought the book Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, Ph.D., back in November after spending time on the Concussion Legacy Foundation's website, where I'd read that one of the most important things you could do for your brain and overall health was get a full night's sleep. I'd seen that recommendation several places, but never paid it any mind. They claimed that lack of adequate sleep could cause mental fogginess and headaches, as well as affect self-regulation and emotion. Getting seven to eight hours would lead to a healthier brain and could help rid the brain of the effects of CTE and other brain disorders. I figured I'd only make it a few pages into the book before it put me to sleep, but I was dead wrong. The writing was excellent and engaging. The information, scary. My teenage years and early adulthood were full of partying into the early morning. After that, it was working graveyard shifts so I could train during the day. Once I had kids, it only got worse. I was unable to start writing until after parenting duties were done and quit around 1 or 2 in the morning. I was one of those people who said they'd sleep when they were dead. There was no doubt I was hurting myself by not getting enough sleep, shortening my life by burning the candle on both ends. Before I'd even gone halfway through the book, I realized it was one of the most important books I'd ever read. It completely changed the way I'd view sleep for the rest of my life. I purchased a Garmin watch to start tracking my sleep, and I began driving my daughter to school an 80-minute round trip full of asshole drivers and inconsiderate parents. The added stress was worth it, though, because it enabled her to get an extra hour of needed sleep. It was around this time that I finally watched the Joe Rogan Experience podcast number 1056, recommended by my buddy Brian Esquivel, who had first warned me about brain damage. I didn't want to watch it because, although I love Joe Rogan and have seen his live stand-up routine close to a dozen times, I didn't want to spend an hour and a half listening to some military guy and a doctor. In the episode, Andrew Marr, a former Special Forces Green Beret, went into detail about how his life derailed and he could find no explanation or relief until he discovered Dr. Mark Gordon, 
the owner of Millennium Neuroregenerative Centers and a worldwide leader in anti-aging medicine, interventional endocrinology. On the podcast, Dr. Gordon described what happens when a traumatic brain injury occurs and dispelled lots of the myths surrounding them. Most people assume an individual needs to be knocked unconscious or have a very significant blow to the head in order to have a TBI. But Dr. Gordon explained the process could be started more easily, even by a minor car accident or a ride on a roller coaster. Once the injury occurs, the brain becomes inflamed, and this inflammation expands and disrupts the brain's ability to self-regulate hormones. Dr. Gordon explained that so many symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, and TBIs overlap, such as depression, anxiety, irritability, cognitive deficits, insomnia, and fatigue. In Dr. Gordon's opinion, PTSD is a manifestation of a TBI. Head injuries are often forgotten but commonly identified during detailed patient histories. His approach is to treat patients with hormone replacement therapy to reduce the inflammation in the brain that has compromised functioning resulting from the injury. He claimed to have turned around the lives of about 1,500 military personnel. Although I didn't believe I needed the protocol, I talked it over with my wife, and we agreed the cost of the program would be worth trying. Even if it didn't do anything for me, I could write about it in this book. I contacted Dr. Gordon's office and found that their normal waiting time had jumped from one week to eight weeks due to a flood of requests from listeners to the Rogan podcast. While well, waiting to be admitted to Dr. Gordon's practice, I continued working on my fiction and keeping my cool, spending most of my day relatively high on cannabis, only using sativas because they helped me with focus and creativity. In February, I began a two-month break from social media just as the Unlocking the Cage hardcover released. As an independent author, it is crucial that I maintain an active social media presence. But instead of launching a huge marketing push, I closed shop, a sure sign that I was sabotaging myself. My right shoulder had become such a problem that it was wrecking my sleep. And in April, I had my first cortisone injection so I could function. The very next week, I had my blood drawn for Dr. Gordon and then headed to Vegas for another visit to the Cleveland Clinic. Depressed because I wouldn't be able to train jujitsu with my friends and scared at what I might discover about my brain. So, the prologue. Man, that was a very hard piece to write, a very hard piece to read. Uh, still, when I read it, I get a little teary eyed. Sometimes I might cry even, especially at the last part where I put about how much damage I have. When I originally wrote that, I did not have the ending. I did not have the last three lines attached to it. I was in a very bad depression when I was writing this. I was trying to spin it positively, but I was looking at all my symptoms and just in a shitty place. Uh, but it was amazing going from, you know, the night before having all these thoughts, writing all this, and then the next day writing, but it's all good. I'm going to fix it. I have to. So that was powerful for me. Still is powerful when I hear it. Uh, it was a change in perspective. I decided I had to do this. There wasn't a question of if I was going to spend the money or if I was going to spend the time or whatever else. At the time, I was really hoping I didn't have any damage, but let's keep going and see. All right, chapter one. I think one of the big takeaways with chapter one was remembering, unlocking the cage, just what a powerful experience it was, what a positive experience that was, and also how grateful I am for Brian pointing out that I was getting my ass kicked day in and day, day out by guys that were, you know, half my age and much, 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 much better athletes. And there was no reason for me to be doing it. And I was maybe, you know, causing damage to myself. But it's also incredible to think that I wasn't worried about it at that time. And I was getting concussions after concussions at a, what, 40, 42 year old. So, but again, it was incredible. I still, I developed so many friendships through Unlocking the Cage. Um, I learned so much more about myself through all the training, being able to get into jiu-jitsu, getting my whole family into jiu-jitsu. So it was definitely an incredible experience. I wouldn't not do it again, but 
That's what I was saying about now the Cleveland Clinic wearing their shirt today, fighting for brain health. That was where, you know, I first started. They are a good source of information. You can check them out. So go, go to the Cleveland Clinic. I don't know if they are still running their fighter studies. I think the last time I checked, they weren't because of the pandemic. So I have not been back to get rechecked. Um, but it is an important program. Man, and thinking back to Vegas, I think I go into Vegas deeper in the book. Uh, that was a pretty rough time. The big takeaway with chapter two is realizing, you know, having hope that the brain could change, that the brain could fix itself. Uh, the book, uh, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch, that gave me hope. Uh, because before then, I was thinking, you no, know, when you are on a decline, whether it's because you're a punch drunk and you play, you know, you box or you play football or you just are starting to go head towards Alzheimer's, like you only hear about it being negative, you know, uh, you hit your 40s and then it's just going to be a decline. So I never thought that it'd be possible to not only fix damage, but to actually improve function. So learning that was incredible. Reading the book Sleep, that definitely helped me a lot. But that book didn't fix anything because my sleep was such a mess. And I didn't even know it. But again, we will get into that later on in the book. But one of the hugest things was, again, my friend Brian Escobel, the one who warned me about the brain damage, him pointing out that uh, Joe Rogan episode 1056 with Dr. Gordon, amazing, amazing man. He has transformed so many lives. Uh, so it, I was didn't want to watch it. But I put in the time, I spent the hour or whatever listening to it. I sent off for my blood work, and that is where we end up. So, guys, hope you're enjoying the story so far. Not a whole lot to talk about yet, but maybe next week there will be. All right, thank you for checking it out. The regular podcast is still on Fridays. These will just be every Tuesday, just popping in to share this audio. If you want to pick up the ebook, you have to get that on Amazon. The audio book is available pretty much everywhere. All right, guys, talk to you next week. Later.